Yeah, so today's lecture is, um, is based on sections 1.3, 4, and 5. Uh, I hope at this point that you have worked through uh, at least some of the homework, and certainly I hope you've watched the lectures that were posted Monday. Um, this, this sort of asynchronous and synchronous thing, I think some of us are still getting used to. Some of us still tried to log in on Monday <laughs> to view the class. And uh, just again, we won't actually meet on Monday uh, there's no class time set aside for that. Uh, it just you know just take that time to watch maybe uh, some lectures or start on some of the homework or start reading the text. Um, I was able to get the videos posted, you know, on Monday morning, and uh, it takes a little bit of time for the for YouTube to process them. So I, I don't know exactly when they became visible for you, but I I work on them on Monday morning and. YouTube spits them out sometime, you know, after that. So um, maybe you could treat Tuesday like the time where you watch those movies or something. But we only meet in person like this on Wednesdays. Um, and I think I've sorted out the polls. I think, I think. So I'll click this little button and uh, I think we'll be able to get a poll later on during this class time. Um, and uh, I'm going to use them like a time for you to work a problem for a few minutes and then give a response at that time. And, you know, that'll help me judge uh, how well you're doing on these things. But, like I said, we're working on problems from 1.3, 4, and 5 today. And um, so if you've watched the lectures, great. This will be a time for you to, to see some problems done, to ask about some problems um, if you have any. I've already got a, a short list of three from so, a student that wanted some help on some questions. Um, so if you have more, if you have more questions, go ahead and um, ask them in the chat. Okay, there it is. Go ahead and ask them in the chat. Now I've got that up here, so I can see that. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and get started with problems from 1.3. So 1.3 is all about the fundamentals of algebraic expressions. And the first question that I want to answer is, is one that a student asked in WebAssign, and it's, it's this. It's not in the book. Uh, it's what is an algebraic term? You know, it's, it's something that I said in the video, but it's, it's something that is... I, I definitely didn't take the time to define <laughs> in the video. So it's uh, it's just one of those things that I, I don't think twice about, but it I should have. So what is an algebraic term? So whenever you whenever you see a polynomial, which you know we've seen lots of at this point, I'll write one down, 12x cubed plus 18x. This is a polynomial. It's a third degree polynomial. And uh, there's, se there's several parts to it. Like there's an anatomy to it. Uh, there's numbers. We call these coefficients. The numbers are multiplied by variables. So the, the 12 is the coefficient for the cubed variable. The 18 is the coefficient for the first degree variable. Um, I've already used the word here. These letters we call variables, which are substitutions for an unknown number. Uh, and then there's, in polynomials, there's sums or differences of things. The sums or differences split apart these things that contain a coefficient and a variable raised to some power and we, we always leave the sums and the differences if the variables are different degrees, right? When we add these things together, we can't just, we can't combine them to say, you know, this is 30 x cubed. Like, we can't say that because the powers on these things are different. They're, they're not the same, so we can't combine them. Um, but a coefficient together with a variable, the product, they're split apart by sums and differences. Each of these two things is what we call a term, an algebraic term. And we can count the terms, right? There are two terms here. So we call this entire thing, we call
call this entire thing a binomial because there are two terms. Term one, term two, so it's a binomial. Okay. Yeah, I skipped right over all of those like basic anatomical things uh, in the lecture, uh, but uh, there we go. I got it now, right? <laughs> so the next question we'll we'll just jump right into is check uh, is finding a sum or a difference. So this is problem. Uh, not from your from your uh, your homework, but this is problem 17 from the textbook. Uh, it'll be the same in your online textbook as what I write down here. Okay. So 17 from section 1.3 is find the sum, the difference, or the product. In this case, we're going to have a couple of those things together, um, and it is negative 2x squared minus 3x plus 1 that's all in, that's all a group in parentheses plus 3x squared plus 5x minus 4 so we've got 1 2 3 a trinomial added to another one, two, three, trinomial. So it's a trinomial plus a trinomial. Now when you're faced with something like this and you see grouping symbols like these parentheses that we have here, one, two, three, four parentheses, um, the problem is trying to, to, to get across the idea that we are taking this number, whatever it is, and we're adding it to this number, whatever it is. All right, we're treating the trinomials each like they are their own entity. And so it, it makes sense to say, add them together or to say, subtract them from each other. Um, and that's actually the problem that I'm going to do. 17 star, I'm changing it. Because when you just add polynomials together, it doesn't matter if there's grouping symbols. You can just drop them and the problem is no different. The difference comes when you have a difference in there, a subtraction sign. So I'll, I'll illustrate what I just said. If you've got a plus sign in front of a, a group which contains a polynomial, nothing changes if you just forget to write those grouping symbols. Okay, so. I can just forget this and this even exist and just write it there. But this negative sign now means we're subtracting this entire group. The whole positive 3x squared plus a 5x minus 4. So we're going to treat this term by term and we're going to subtract each term at a time. So we need to subtract a positive 3x squared, which means we're subtracting 3x squared. We're going to subtract a positive 5x, which means we're subtracting 5x. And we're going to subtract a negative 4, but subtracting a negative number is really adding. There's a name for what we just did, where we take this and we multiply it through. It's the distributive action. It's the distributive property at work. We're distributing that negative sign. If it were a plus sign, we can still treat it like the distributive property, right? But no signs change because it's just adding a positive or adding a negative, and that, that's just like adding or subtracting. So nothing, nothing's different with a positive sign there. Okay, when you get to this point in problems like this, where you're just adding polynomials together, um, now it's a now it's just a matter of combining similar terms. Now, similar terms are terms which have the same variables raised to the same power. 
There's only one variable in here, it's an x, so we don't need to worry about that. So we just need to worry about the powers. And I will underline, I will underline them in similar colors. So here we've got a negative 2x squared and a negative 3x squared. Altogether, that's negative 2 minus 3, so that's negative 5 x squared. You know, we think about these terms as the squares of x's, and we see that there's minus 5 of them. So we're just counting how many of these squares of x we have in this, in this sum. Uh, here I see a negative 3x, and I see a, a negative 5x. So how many x's do we have here? We've got negative 8 x's. Then we've got some constants here. These are the zeroth degree terms. And so we've got 1 and 4. All together, that's 5. Okay, And that's the final result. We've subtracted one trinomial from another. Uh, to give us this final solution. The way that I've written it is, is the standard way of writing it, where you've got the highest degree term on the left, and you work your way down on the right. So this is called the standard form of a polynomial. Okay, questions on that? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and move on to the next problem. Okay, um, let's deal with multiplying some things out. So this comes from question 26. 26 says to multiply the algebraic express expression, and it says to use a certain method called the FOIL method. Uh, do any of you remember what FOIL stands for, maybe perhaps from high school. It's okay if you don't. Isn't it a first, outer, inner, last? That's exactly what it stands for, yes. First, outer, inner, last. It's a uh, mnemonic device. I think that's the correct term. Yeah, and it's it's something that's used. Great, great response there, Jay. It's exactly that. It's something that's used for multiplying two binomials. Okay, so this only works for multiplying binomials together. I showed you in the lecture video how to multiply any polynomials together through just distributing over and over and over again. And I, I said how obnoxious it gets. Um, and I said that there's certain patterns that you'll find that can make it a lot faster. The FOIL method is one of these patterns. Um, and it's, and I'll show you a second pattern, a second method. Um, but this is just something that helps you multiply. binomials. Okay? It's something for multiplying binomials. And it I'll, I'll example it with problem 26, which says to multiply 2s plus 5 times 4s minus 1. So we've got two binomials. Each of these things has two terms, a first degree term and a constant term. And I'm going to just underline here the first term of each. So the FOIL method says that we're going to multiply the first terms together. We're going to add that to the outer terms multiplied together. That's a times a negative one. So I'm including that negative sign here. We're going to add that to the product of the inner terms. And 
and we'll add that to the product of the last terms. And when you go through and simplify this out, 2 times 4 is 8, s times s is s squared, 2s times negative 1 is negative, so minus 2s, the 5 times 4 is 20s, the 5 times negative 1 is negative 5. When you go through and multiply this out and simplify it out, the final result is a trinomial often, but it is the product that you're looking for. So the FOIL method, which stands for multiplying the firsts, the outers, the inners, and the lasts terms, <laughs> I don't know where all the S's should go in that term, but multiplying the first, the outer, the inner, and the last pairs from each binomial um, that gives you the final result. If you looked at it in terms of distributing, this is what you would get if you did the whole distribution process. But the first outer inner last helps you just to remember um, where th what you know what's being multiplied by what. So that's that's one nice method for multiplying binomials, and it's usually what's taught to students in high school. So I thought maybe some of you would remember. But there's another one that's even uh, that's even a little more exhaustive and I'm going to example that now with question 48. So this is something that's called algebra tiles and this is a bit more general. It's a technique for multiplying any polynomials together and actually they don't have, they don't have to be polynomials. They can be non-polynomials too but uh, a sum or a difference, a big string of sums and differences of algebraic ex algebraic expressions. doesn't matter what they are. So question 47. Um, let me finish the sentence before I do it. Technique for multiplying any polynomials, since we're in that polynomial section. Um, 47 says, oh, and I wrote 48. I'll do 48. That's fine. 48 says, x plus 1 times 2x squared minus x plus 1. Okay. So algebra tiles is a way of organizing this distributive process where we would normally take x plus 1 and multiply it by every single term in here and then go through and distribute the 2x squared throughout the x plus 1 the negative x through the x plus 1, and then the 1 through the x plus 1. It's a way of organizing all of that in a really fancy manner. And the way you do that is you pick one of these two items in a product. So uh, it doesn't matter to me which one we pick. I usually pick the one on the left first. And then you list its terms vertically. So I've taken x plus 1, which has the term x, and it has the term plus 1, and I've listed them vertically here. Then you take the other uh, polynomial here. We've got a trinomial, so there's three terms. And we're going to list its terms horizontally above this. So 2x squared minus x, 1. Okay, so you pick one of the two, it doesn't matter which one, you list its terms vertically. Then you take the other one and you list its terms horizontally. And you can then consider this like it was an Excel spreadsheet with like columns and rows. This is where the tiles comes in. Now, the, the common error that students make is not remembering to keep the negative signs with the terms. So this is you know 2x squared minus x plus 1. Notice that I took this minus sign 
and attached it to the X, right? We could, we could alternatively think of this as 2X squared plus negative X plus 1. So that negative sign is really like grouped with the X. And that's a common mistake. Students will often forget that and they'll just write it like this and then the whole thing's gonna be messed up. So just make sure that you keep negative signs attached um, as you go. Okay, so the remainder of this process is really quite simple. You just, you go from tile to tile, multiplying every row element by its column element. So we're gonna take the x and we're gonna multiply it by 2x squared, which is 2x cubed. Then we'll take the x and we'll multiply it by the negative x, which is negative x squared. Then the x is multiplied by the one, which is x. Then we go to the next row and we're multiplying the one by every column element. So uh, I, I guess I should say every column header perhaps is a better way of saying it. So we take one times two x squared, one times negative x, and one times one. So if I had more terms, right, if this was not a trinomial and if this was not a binomial, I would just have a bigger rectangle with more squares or tiles that I would need to fill in, right? And it doesn't matter that these are polynomials. They could have square roots in them or something like that. It doesn't matter what they are. You can do this process for distributing for any kind of function so this is really kind of a general process. Um, so, so here we go. So what do we do from here? Well, we just need to combine like terms now and we'll have our final result. Now algebra tiles, if you've listed things nicely, have this really nice pattern of the diagonals are like terms. Right, we've got 2x cubed, we've got the x squareds there on the purple diagonal, we've got the x's on the red diagonal, and we've, oops, and we've got the one down here on the, uh, the last diagonal, which is by itself too. So now we just need to add these terms together. 2x cubed, it's the only one, so 2x cubed. Uh, 2x squared and minus x squared together make just 1x squared. Uh, x and minus x make zero x's, so I'm not even going to write it, and then one. And that's the final result. So algebra tiles, it's a really general process for multiplying things together. Um, so I, I think it's definitely beneficial to learn. So these are not things that are, you know, in the lectures. These are not things that are in the theory portion because these really aren't theory elements. Uh, these are, you know, practically speaking, when it comes to multiplying things out, here's a couple techniques that you can use. Okay. So I'm going to, I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm going to try, going to try to click this button that says, let's take a poll and we'll see what happens. So I think I've selected the first one. Yes, here we go. So you should see now a poll in front of you. Maybe someone's art, two people have already answered. I can see that. So it's working. <laughs> All right, it's working. So I'll give you a minute here to think about this. It's not too much of a hard question, but uh, this is you know where that participation element comes in. So if you are, if you are, uh, if you're here, this is not a problem, right? This is not a problem at all. Not terribly hard.
So let's see, there's 18 of us here today. So it looks like there are four people that have yet to respond. So uh, at this, this question, I don't think should take too long. So at this point, if you uh, if you haven't found your solution, go ahead and throw an answer in there. If you're still listening, I'll give you a few seconds to just throw an answer in there. There was just this one poll. Oh, okay, okay. Just this one question. No, no, no. Yeah, if you answered it a minute ago, then you're doing good. But there's still a few people that haven't answered, and so I'm just saying, if you haven't solved it, just put an answer in, right? Because this is how I'm, I'm trying to take attendance, more or less. So it would appear as if there are a few people MIA. <laughs> so I'll click end, and then I'll be able to have a recording of that. So. Uh, to share the results, it looks like I can uh, share the results with you. Can you see that? Okay, so most people correctly said binomial. Right, so we've got a 3x and we've got a 2. And they're separated by a minus sign. Right, so there's two terms here, which means these. this is a binomial. Okay, all right. So a monomial, just to give an example of a monomial here, a monomial, this first uh, part of this word is mono, right? And it's not, we're not talking about the sickness that you can get, right? <laughs> we're not talking about mononucleosis, we're talking about the prefix mono, which means single or one. So there's only one term in a monomial. So a monomial would look like two. That's a monomial, technically. Uh, 3x to the fifth. There's only one term. That's a monomial. Square root of x. Is it a monomial? The answer is no, it is not, because that's not a polynomial. It has a fractional power, so it's actually not a polynomial, which means it's not a monomial. It's still an algebraic expression, but it's not a polynomial. But uh, we're just splitting hairs at this point. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, so at this point, you know, we, we've multiplied, we've added things together, and it is 832. So I'm going to get to a couple questions that uh, some students asked. And these have to do with factoring. So factoring. So uh, I, I'm not going to do the exact problem that a student asked because it was exactly a homework problem. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and do one that is very similar. Uh, so this is question 91 from the textbook. And it is. It says to factor completely five. Excuse me. X to the five halves minus x to the one half. And then it gives the hint of first factoring out the the biggest fractional exponent that you can. So factoring, right? When you when you factor a number, like say 24, what you're doing is you're listing out a product that equals 24, right? So, so six times four, that's factoring. That's a factoring of 24. Uh, I can factor it three times eight. That's another factoring. When they say to factor completely in the instructions, they're, they're trying to get at something that's kind of like prime factorization, where you've, you've factored it out as much as you can. So 6 is 2 times 3, and 4 is 2 times 2. So factoring 24 completely is factoring it like this. 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. For an algebraic expression, 
they want you to factor it, you know, to as many linear or, or uh, linear or uh, first degree terms as possible. Um, but in questions like this, they're also meaning for you to factor out fractional exponents too. So the first thing I'm going to just identify is that we can write this like that. Five halves is four halves plus one half. And we remember, I hope, that there's a, a, a pattern or there's a property of exponents here that says we can rewrite this base raised to a sum as the product of that. Right? That was something that we learned in the previous sections. If you multiply two things together that have the same base, you can write it as that base raised to the sum of the powers. Okay, and now this looks a little nicer because we've got two terms and both of them have a common factor. So we can, we can do this thing, which is the reverse of the distributive action. We can undistribute that because it's in both terms to this. x to the 1 half multiplied by, and I'm going to simplify this now. I don't want anyone to miss it. I'm going to simplify 4 halves to 2. 4 halves is 2. So I'm just going to simplify that, but I don't want you to miss that. Uh, the reason this is here is because if I were to go back and distribute this again, we would have exactly this, right? So that's why the x squared is there. The subtraction is still here, and this is now a 1. The reason that's a 1 is because if I were to distribute this back, I would have exactly this. 1 times x to the 1 half is x to the 1 half. So whenever you factor out, you need to sort of ask yourself the question, what's left? You know, what do I need to multiply what I factored out by to get what I had originally? So we're pretty close here, but there's one more step. Does anyone recognize it? Can't x squared minus 1 still be factored? Into what? Uh, x plus 1, x minus 1. Nice. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So x plus 1 times x minus 1. This is one of those special patterns that we, I talked about in the lecture. If you have a difference, so it's a difference, of perfect squares. We've got x squared, and we've got 1 squared. You can rewrite it always, 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 always like this. Okay, and that's the final result. This is a factoring of the one that they wanted us to, you know, factor, the thing that they wanted us to factor. Um, but it is sort of a special factoring because we've got lines multiplied together, we've got binomials multiplied together, and then sort of the ugly. I don't know, the, the elephant in the room, the x to the one-half power. Questions on this one?
I just stopped sharing the results of the polling and the chat popped back up. Um, Jay, you said like M or B or any number. Uh, I don't remember what that was in regards to. Okay, okay. I, I just, I'm seeing some more chats pop up, so I think it paused everything. Okay, yeah, thanks, Jay. And Giovanna, I, I'm, I'm reading it now, so I'll count you here. <laughs> okay, next problem. Uh, this is still from section 1.3, uh, and this one's factoring something completely again, but it's... Uh, this is question 103. It says to factor 9x squared minus 36x uh, minus 45. And it says to do this, just to factor this completely, which again means we're looking for some factorization that looks like a, a product of binomials. Okay. Uh, this is a trinomial. It's a second degree trinomial. Um, and I, you know, when I look at this, I, I, the first thing that I see is that uh, there's a numerical, there's a coefficient factor that we can pull out first. So I notice that this is 9, obviously, and this is divisible by 9, and so is this. When you see something like that, the first thing that you, you should probably try to do is take out that common factor. This is 9x squared minus 9 times 4x, which is uh, 36, and then minus 9 times 5, that's 45. These all have a 9 in that factorization. So let's take it out front. 9 x squared minus 4x minus 5. You know, if we think about this again, like the, you know, the, the opposite of distributing, then it, 9 times that should give us this. And 9 times that should give us that. And 9 times this should give us that. We're just sort of working backwards, right? So, okay. So now I'm just going to keep writing a nine here because that nine's always going to be there. I assume we'll need maybe one or two more steps. I'm not sure. Um, so I'm just going to write a nine, and then I'm going to write parentheses. <laughs> that nine's always going to be there, but we can essentially forget about it. So how do we multiply, or how do we factor x squared? minus 4x minus 5. Well, we're going to factor it into two binomials. I, th I think that is our goal. And if you remember from the FOIL method, the first two elements of these binomials, they always multiply to give you the first term in this trinomial. the first two binomial terms multiply to give you the first term in the trinomial. So we see an x squared there, which means we need to pick some pair of powers of x. I'm going to just go ahead and put x and x. That's the simplest way you can do it. But it's not the only way you have to do it. I'll let you think about that, maybe on your own time. Michaela says capital X and lowercase x. Sure, that works too. <laughs> okay. Also from the FOIL method, maybe you remember that the last two um, terms in the binomials multiply together to give you the last term in the trinomial. So now we're looking at two numbers which multiply to give you negative 5. So we have two options negative 5 times positive 1 or positive 5 times negative 1. There's two options. How you determine which one it is is by looking right here in the middle term. 
So we see a negative 4x. Now I know that this is going to be this is going to be the minus 5 times the plus 1. And the reason I know that is because negative 5 and 1 add to negative 4. They add to negative 4. So if you thought about this in, in terms of multiplication, x times 1 is one of the distributions that you would need to do. And you would take also 5, negative 5 times x. Those two distributions in particular produce an x term. The other ones, x times x, that's x squared. Negative 5 times 1, that's just a constant. These two distributions in particular give you the x terms. So when you combine them, what you're doing is you're really adding the coefficients together. And those coefficients are the factors over here. So in order to correctly choose which factors to use, you need to ask yourself which sum of factors gives you that middle term. And that gives us the final result. So we've got 9 times, I guess I didn't need that extra 9, 9 times x minus 5 times x plus 1. So for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next section. I know I didn't quite get to all the questions that students had emailed and asked for, but we're going to go ahead and move on to section 1.4, which is rational expressions. We will get into a few, um, a few factoring problems here as well. So hopefully that'll be fine. So this is now section 1.4, which is rational expressions. And um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, just out, talk about the domain of something here. So this is question nine. Asterisk. I've changed it slightly. So the question here is, what is the domain if you haven't watched the lecture? Um, this is a rational expression, x squared minus 1 over x plus 5. A rational expression is obtained by taking a polynomial and dividing it by another polynomial. Okay, It's a ratio of polynomials. Domain describes all of the allowed real numbers that you can plug in. So to, to answer the question, what is the domain, is to sort of identify the numbers which, you know, if you plugged them in to this, if you replaced x with the real number, you'd kind of run into problems. You, you want to identify those and then throw them out. So go ahead in the chat. What's the what's the domain? That's taken much longer than I thought it should. So let me teach you a technique here. <laughs> so when you're, when you're, it's not one. No, thank you though. Thank you though. Um, so when you're, you know, you're, you're asked for the domain, 
you should think through actually trying to compute this. Right? So, so if I gave you this function, what does it say? It says to take a number, square it, and subtract one. Then it says to divide that by the number that I give you, or the number that you choose, plus five. So there's actually like grouping symbols here. So, so first, square and subtract one. That's the first thing you would do. You'd pick a number, you'd square it, you'd subtract one. The next thing you would do is you would also just add five, okay? Then divide the results. So I'm just, I'm thinking through how I would actually do this if I had to, you know, like compute this thing. Um, Giovanna, interval notation is perfect. It's perfect. So is set builder notation. So is succinct set notation, which means to use the complicated symbols like the capital R and things like that. So when you're thinking through actually doing this, you know, the whole time you're asking yourself, what are the steps? And do I have problems at any step with any number? So now these are easier questions. Do you have any problems with squaring a real number? Probably not, right? That you can square any real number without issue, right? A calculator could do that for you. What kind of, oh, perfect. Michael, perfect. What kind of numbers can you get from squaring? You can, you can get zero, you can get any positive number, you can get any, that's it. You can't get any negative numbers by squaring. So you only get positives, okay? Can you subtract one from a positive number? Of course. Okay, so there's no issues here. Okay, so nothing here. So at this point, any real number is still allowed. Okay, next step, we, we needed to add five to a number and there's no issues here. If I give you any real number, you're gonna, you're just gonna add five, no problem. So we're still good here. We can still sort of plug in any real number. But in this last step, we need to take the result of two, I'll, I'll call this two, and we need to divide the result of one by it. Are there problems with division that you know about? Right, if I gave you any number, like let, let's say 10, 10, what numbers can't I divide 10 by? What numbers can't be here? Zero. Zero. Zero is the only one. Can't divide by zero. So we need to go back to step two. And we need to ask ourselves, did something give us zero when we added five to it? Yes. If we add five to negative five, we have a problem. So if x is five, negative five rather, then in step two, we get x plus five is zero. Consequently, when we go to divide the results, we're dividing by zero. Yeah, in set builder notation, that's perfect. Well done, Giovanna. And in, in uh, interval notation, Michael Dean, that's perfect. Yep. So we can write this a, couple, couple, a few different ways. Uh, in the chat, Mike says, negative infinity, any negative number up to not including five. He puts a comma because there's no way to write this symbol. 
but you can sometimes use a capital U for that. Together with, this means the union, so together with, negative 5, not including it, all the way up to any, any positive number that you want, as big as you want. All this says is, if you take a number line, we just want to cut out negative 5. Everything else is okay, but we just want to sort of cut out negative 5. In set builder notation, it gets a little easier. Every x is possible except x negative 5. <laughs> All x's such that x is not negative 5. Okay. There's an even shorter way to write all this. It's that capital R symbol that I wrote, minus this sort of, uh, I don't know what that's called, backslash, negative 5. Every real number except for negative 5. OK. So that's finding domains. It is difficult. It's not easy. Um, getting so cold in my basement. It's like 60 degrees right here. So I'm going to turn this heater on, even though that's going to create some static for you hearing, I think. I hope that's OK. But I'm like shivering. <laughs> you guys are just lucky I'm not wearing like a parka and a hood, you know, like a big hat it's, uh, with, with mittens. <laughs> Maybe I'm just being a weenie. I don't know. All right. Uh, how are we doing? 8.56. Yeah, we. That problem took a little bit longer, but um, you know, finding the domain of a question like this, it's, it's definitely not easy because there's a lot to think about. But there's really just two things that you need to look out for at this point, dividing by zero and square roots of negatives. So you know, when I gave you this problem, I thought this would just be a five second, x can't be negative five you know, <laughs> answer, but I think it needed a little bit more explanation. So maybe, do I have a poll for something like this? Wouldn't that be great? Here we go. So I've put up another poll and go ahead and answer that. Find the domain of the square root of x plus 3. So I couldn't write that in into Zoom's poll feature, but it's the square root of the whole x plus 3. When you try to solve this, think about how you would actually do this, right? You'd take a number, you would add 3 to it, and then, you know, you can do that in your head probably. And then you'd go to a calculator and put that number in and click the square root button. And the question is, what numbers can you do that for? What numbers are allowed? have answered, so I'll keep watching that. Okay, just four people left. Two people left. If you were having a problem before, 
answering with the polls because of the internet connection. Um, it seemed like you were able to use the chat before, so you can throw your answer in the chat too. I'll just sort of keep track of that. Okay, if you haven't answered it, or if you haven't figured it out at this point, go ahead and just throw an answer in there randomly. There you go. Just so that I know you're there. Okay, and here we go. Any real number bigger than three is the uh, democratic result, and it is the correct result, right? Kind of, but but the I think I would have to say that that's the best answer. <laughs> Any real number bigger than negative three isn't exactly right. Why not? What's wrong about it? Anyone? <laughs> yes. Why can't we plug in negative 3? It's the square root of negative 3 plus 3, which is the square root of 0, which is asking us what number, when squared, gives us 0. Hmm. Probably 0. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, any number bigger than negative 3, including negative 3. And the reason is, if we plug in anything over here, we're dealing with a number that's smaller than negative 3. And then when you do the addition, you, you end up with a negative result, which for the first part of the computation is fine. Like you, you can add three to get negatives. That's totally allowed. But when you go to compute the next one, which means taking the square root, we're gonna start dealing with imaginary numbers, which are entirely real. They're, they're real things. They're really used in computations for things like impedance in an electrical circuit and capacitance that they're totally used in real applications, but they're not real numbers. So square roots of negatives are things we also watch out for, just like dividing by zero. Okay, so next problem uh, is this one. I want you to simplify this. This is problem 47. Uh, forget it, I'm gonna skip to 48. It's a little bit more intuitive, uh, less intuitive, but more explanatory for what's going on. So A and B, we've got two variables. We've got three fractions. Oh, what was the answer to the poll? Are there negative? Okay, let me let me stop. So I'll, you, I'll, I'll scroll up just a little bit uh, so that you can write that down but I've got a couple questions. Are there negative points for wrong answers? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, negative points. Are you asking about the poll? The polls aren't graded. Yeah, okay, so the polls aren't graded. No, the polls are, it's just, it's just a way I have of engaging you uh, and uh, making sure that you're there. Um, it's not graded. Uh, yeah, if you're not responding, that receives negative points because then you're not here, right? So, and that's that's really the ultimate purpose. Um, since uh, we're taking attendance here, so if you're responding to polls and you're here, it doesn't matter how you respond. When you don't respond to the polls for the day, I know you weren't there, so. 
Um, next question. Are there, uh, wait, so what was the answer to the poll? Uh, well, um, so we needed to make sure that what we had underneath this was a positive or zero. So it's a number that is positive or zero, which means that we need to have any number bigger than or equal to negative three. So in set notation, it's a set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to negative three. In interval notation, negative three with a square bracket to represent that we can use negative three to positive infinity. And the other notation I showed you is actually not more succinct in this case. It's all real numbers without negative infinity to negative three, not including negative three. So it's, it's actually harder to write that out. It's a longer. So that's the. Those all describe the same set of numbers. So that was the answer. Yep. Okay, so back to this one. Is first my question is are these three things rational expressions? Are there ratio are they ratios of polynomials? It's a yes or no. What do you think? Kayla says no. Why not, Michaela? What do you think? I feel like they include the monomials in the denominator. It wouldn't be an equal ratio. I see. So what? So so long as there's, you know, any polynomial divided by any polynomial, that's a rational expression. So we've got a monomial here, and we've got monomials here. That that's okay. So it's not that. I guess the bigger thing that I'm wondering is, is it okay to have multiple variables? So I've got a bit of a sweet tooth, right? And uh, that means that I love eating candy and sugary things. Uh, on any given day, I have no idea how much candy I will eat or how many times I will eat candy. <laughs> but there's pretty much a guarantee that I will eat candy at some point. So the amount of candy that I eat is the number of times that I'm going to eat candy times the number of candy number one that I eat plus the number of candy number two that I eat plus dot 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 dot. However many candies that I choose to eat. You know, I go to the candy jar and I grab five of each or two of each or one of this and three of those and then you know, I do that three times a day. So this is a, a this is something like this. N times C1 plus N times C2 plus da da da. So this is a polynomial. It just has two variables or three variables, that's fine. Um, so long as there are no fractional powers, we're good, okay? So with this problem, one thing that it shows is that you can have multiple variables. That's absolutely fine. The next thing that it shows is how do you add things together with multiple variables when they've got different denominators? Well, Jay in the chat has basically answered this for us. We need to find the common denominator. So we need to look at the factorizations. And we need to sort of introduce the factors that are missing from each denominator uh, in order to get a common denominator. And Jay said expertly, the common denominator is, LCD is the least common denominator, is a squared 
v squared. Perfect. So if you look at the first denominator, its factorization is a times a. The next one is a times b. The next one is b times b. If we want to find a denominator that has all of these factors and only the factors, right? We don't want extra factors. We want the smallest number of them that contains all of these. Well, we need this. We need to make this list. So from this first one, we've got a times a. So now this first denominator is listed here. The second denominator has a times b. We already have one a here. So if we just multiply by a b here, we notice that our product now has inside it this denominator. Okay. And then our last denominator has a b times a b. We have one b here, but not two. So let's introduce another one so that our last denominator is now found in this product. Okay, this process of factoring denominators and then listing out a product which has in it, you know, each denominator. Here's the first denominator. Here's the second denominator. Here's the third denominator. That process of listing those out is the process of finding the least common denominator. Common because this contains every single one of these. Least because it is the smallest denominator that does so. So this is our least common denominator, or a squared b squared. And the chat, J is just solving this for us. So <laughs> great job. So. Uh, so to, to continue with this problem, uh, Jay, you can go take a nap or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, to solve this problem, we need to add and subtract these fractions together, which means we need to make sure that they have the same denominator, which means we need to introduce some things here that are missing. Because as it is, we can't just add them together. They've got different denominators. So how do we introduce? This should be a common, this should be familiar to you. We're going to multiply by one in each of these. And the way that we do this, right, is we look at what is missing from the common denominator here. So this first one is a squared, which is right there. What's missing is b squared everything else. So we're going to multiply this fraction by b squared over b squared. That way the denominator is now a squared b squared. Okay, for the next one, I see we've got a b, which is right there. What's missing is another a and another b. So I'm going to multiply this by AB divided by AB. Right. Last one. Same process. We've got a B squared here, so there's that. What's missing is A squared. So we're going to multiply this by A squared over A squared. So now they all have the same denominator, right? And now we can go ahead and add these things together. When fractions have the same denominator, the result is a fraction with that denominator. In the denominator, right? And then in the numerator, we actually just have the sum or difference of everything that we've written, which is 2b squared It's this minus 3ab plus 4a squared. Okay.
Now this doesn't look like you know your common um, your common rational expression problem, but let me ask you one then. This certainly looks like something that you might see this, this like uh, this in this section, and I, I think that you could tell me right now what the answer is without doing any work. So this has the exact same form as the problem above. 2 over a factor squared minus 3 over a factor times a different factor. But one of those is the same as the other one we just had. Plus 4 over the other factor squared. The answer is 2 times x plus 1 squared minus 3 times x minus 1 times x plus 1 plus 4 times x minus 1 squared, all divided by x minus 1 squared times x plus 1 squared. Right? The point of that previous problem is that factors that are polynomials, we just treat them like a single variable. Right? It, it doesn't matter what's written inside those parentheses. We're, we're going to treat it like a group of things. So we're going to be multiplying and dividing by squares and, or products of these things, and we're just going to you know, use them like they're their own little objects, like a single variable A or a single variable B. And uh, that's going to help us solve, you know, you know, add fractions and solve equations. Which is what section 1.5 is on, and <laughs> 1.5. We just, I didn't have the time. So doing problems always takes longer than you suspect it will. Um, so with that, I will, with the last three minutes, just put this on the screen. So 1.5, if you have questions that you want solved, or help with. Solved or helped. Help on. There you go. That's an alternative word there. That you want solved or helped or help on, um, just email me. If you can't make it to office hours, tomorrow. Um, one student has made exceptional use of office hours so far to date. And that's okay. If you don't need it, you don't need it. If you can't come, you can't come. So, um, but it is a great time where you can just, you know, you can come and you can, even if you don't have questions, you can literally do your homework with me just sitting there. And the second you have a question or a problem, I can help. Um, so it, I think I think that uh, it's a really nice time for you to get some, I guess you could say, personal tutoring for free. It's what I'm here for if you need it. Um, but if you can't come, shoot me an email. 1.5 is about solving equations. Um, there's a lot of tricky problems that can come up there. Um, essentially, you know, you're 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 uh, you're adding things to both sides of an equation. You're subtracting both, uh, you're subtracting things from both sides of the equations, you're multiplying and dividing, you're squaring both sides, you're just trying to find, you know, those numbers which make an equation true. Uh, and there's a lot of steps in these problems, they can be difficult. Um, 
but the lecture's up on that, so give it a watch if you haven't yet. It explains how to solve quite a few things. Um, but if there's still problems, go ahead and email me questions or come to office hours. Uh, again, office hours is it's on Zoom, so you just go to Blackboard and click the link, and it's uh, it's 145 to three, but that's negotiable. If you want another time, that's negotiable. Um, I think on Blackboard it's actually listed as 1.30. Uh, that's because when you schedule Zoom meetings on Blackboard, for some reason it doesn't let you change the minutes except in increments of 30 every half hour. So that's, I didn't think it was a big problem. I still don't because this is negotiable. <laughs> you can email me for a different time if you want. Okay. Um, let's see, what else is coming up? Um, 1.1 and 1.2 homework was due Monday. Um, 1.3, 4, and 5 homework is due next Monday. Uh, a quiz on section 1.1 and 1.2 is this Friday. It'll be open for the full day, and you'll be able to take it whenever you want. It is timed at 10 minutes. Uh, unless you have uh, accommodations for some such thing. Um, and so in that case, you'll have whatever time is allotted to you for that. Um, it's not too difficult, but you do need to make sure that you've, you know, that you understand the material from 1.1 and 1.2. Okay? If there are no questions, uh, I'll let you go. It's, it's, it was great to have you today, and I'll see you again maybe tomorrow, but certainly next Wednesday. Um, I'll stick around now for a few minutes if you do have any questions and if you do have time and want to ask them now. But if not, I will see you next time, okay?